Uh, hi, how's it going? Uh, thanks for coming out to your presentation. Uh, my name is Bradley Smith. This is Ian Pillay. Uh, and today we'll be presenting on the data lake, security, governance, and multi-tenancy. Three very important topics, three very hot topics at the moment. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Bradley Smith. I am a Hadoop administrator alongside Ian Pillay. Um, so I consider myself a jack of all trades, dealt with TensorFlow, graphing, the rest of it. Um, my interests in life are track racing, so that's my passion, outside of work, if I ever get the chance. Uh, Ian Pillay, on the other hand, he is also a uh, Hadoop administrator. He is an open source connoisseur, and his interests are game design, very passionate, deals with a lot, a lot of the new technologies like Unity and Blender. But uh, to get into it, Ian, <coughs> you stand yep. back. So Bradley and myself, we work in the open source big data space at Standard Bank. Um, but let's quickly take a look at who Standard Bank are. Um, we're the biggest bank in Africa. We operate in over 25 countries, including the continents of North America, Europe, and Asia. 155 years old, and yeah, nearly 15 million retail customers. So yeah, that's about us. Cool. Uh, so getting into it, uh, we sort of focus on uh, transparent security, uh, which is focused on the user experience. So there's two topics to talk about here. Uh, transparent security. So we don't want the users to know about security, because if they do, something's gone horribly wrong. Um, so we try to keep the uh, security transparent as possible while still being enforced. Um, I'm sure you guys have come across a lot of errors where you get like GSS errors, et cetera, which causes users to have a bad experience. Um, so the next big thing is focusing on user experience. Uh, if you don't achieve what the user requires, they will do something else. They will attempt to go elsewhere. Um, and we've seen that happen as well um, where the cloud is involved. So at the bank, we have an enterprise security model. Uh, it focuses on two concepts, proactive versus reactive. Um, proactive has two sub-themes. The first being to prevent. So ideally, you want to stop people from even breaching your cluster, your environment, your bank, for example. The next is to predict. In order to stay up to date with latest threats, you have to predict where that will hit and when. And this is becoming more of a theme across the board because uh, attacks happen rapidly and extensively. The next is reactive. So once you are breached, how do you respond? What do you do? Uh, the first thing is to actually detect that you have been breached. A lot of people miss this. A lot of attacks happen and no one is made aware until it appears on the internet somewhere. Um, outside of that, once you've detected the threat, you need to respond and contain it. Um, you need to minimize the impact. You need to minimize the loss of data. You need to figure out who did it and how, and then plug that gap. So compliance is a huge concern at the moment. Um, We've got GDPR for the European countries, and we have Poppy, which is a subset of GDPR based on GDPR. It's a South African Act, which is the uh, Protection of Personal Information Act, um, essentially covering the same things. Who do you send your data to? Where does that data go? How does it get there? Uh, luckily, we don't have to worry about deleting data, but I know the GDPR, that's the main focus. So after that, we have the five pillars of enterprise security, a lot of white papers on this. A lot of companies uh, sort of share these, uh, this data. So we just define what the pillars are, what the intent is, and what the tool is. So for administration, that's basically how do I set policy? What is policy? How do we define it? Um, once the policy is defined, you need to implement it. And for that, we use Apache Ambari and Apache Ranger. So that'll be like we have business units. Business units should not be able to see other business units' data. Therefore, there must be policies around that. The next is authentication. Um, so are you who you say you are when you access systems, platforms, and applications? In order to achieve this, we have Kerberos and LDAP. Uh, so there will be a ticket handed out for you so that you can say, yes, I am this person. I do have access to that platform. After that is authorization. So what can I do? What do I have the ability to see? For that, we also use Apache Ranger, uh, LDAP client, and Apache Knox. The important thing here is once you get access to the platform, what data do you have access to? And on Data Lake, this is extremely important because you need to limit what people can and can't do. Uh, after that is auditing, so this is for after the fact. What did people do? And this is useful for multiple things, specifically security and for um, enabling a better user experience. Finally, we get data protection. This is also quite a uh, widespread topic at the moment. The intention for data protection is to cover your data so that even if it is breached, 
it's unusable to external parties. It has no value except to those who use it internally. Um, so we use FPE, Format Preserving Encryption, uh, Tokenization, and SSL for encryption on the go. Cool. Uh, Ian, this is for you. This is a diagram of what we have at the bank. <coughs> so yeah, um, I'm just going to go through what we're using and how we're using it. So in the middle, we have our Hadoop cluster, be it HDFS or Hive. Around that, we have our Nox Nox's defined network range. And that Nox is pretty much a system that allows people from outside to connect internally and proxy themselves on the cluster. So we'll start from our ETL source. Um, we have to start with authentication. So an example would be trying to ingest some data. What do you do? The ETL source would initialize itself and get a ticket from the KDC. Once it has its ticket, it should be able to connect to the platform. From there, what would it be able to do on the platform? That's where Ranger comes in. Say, yes, you're allowed to read or write where and when. Um, after that, any data that's stored on the cluster from this ingestion would have a Hive schema applied to it, for example, and then you'd be able to do that. Um, at this is where Atlas comes in. You'd be able to infer me metadata and lineage. So now that the ingestion is pretty much covered, we can look at how users access the data. So we have external and internal. So a Nox user, as an example here, is running an HDFS command to go over an SSL-enabled Nox server, thus protecting the user's credentials during transmission. Um, submit a request. The Nox server would initialize and get its ticket, be able to run the command. The same would apply to an edge node user, which runs internally. It would just be that they interact with the services directly. And you also have users such as BI tools, o JDBC, ODBC, or Hive users. Yeah, it pretty much covers how we use it. So in combining all of our information, uh, what we have with our own data security as well as what the bank provides through its enterprise model, we've come up with this data lake security model which enables us to cover against protect proactive and reactive themes. Um, so for example, if we look at proactive, we'll look at prevention. Um, prediction isn't really covered at the moment because of how sort of new it is, but uh, for prevention, we have multiple different layers in place in order to protect um, our data. So if we go through prevention, you'll see that we have the perimeter, the perimeter security, for example. Uh, Nox is a massive one because it allows external users access to the cluster without compromising internal usage of that data. Um, and that's very good for external websites, such as if you want to expose your data to the internet, uh, it is possible to do. Not recommended, but possible to do. Cool. So. As with many organizations, we face security challenges. Everyone does. It's inevitable that it will happen. Um, just a quick question. Who has heard of Kerberos? <laughs> OK, to be expected. Um, so Kerberos is not fun to work with, but it is a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, the bank has a lot of legacy software, and this makes it extremely difficult to Kerberize clusters. Acting as a data lake, it was our responsibility to ensure authentication was correct. So what we did is we implemented uh, Kerberos. In doing so, however, all downstream and upstream systems needed to be Kerberized. And that was a massive challenge, and it was a grueling effort. Um, at the moment, we have about 10 systems Kerberized out of the hundreds that we have at the bank, but it's a start. Um, You've got to start somewhere. The next is a siloed security team. So banks are very siloed. Um, that's known. And a lot of teams don't like working together. So a good example of this is we have a separate Linux team and a separate security team. To get them in a room in order to enable security, um, specifically AD integration, was a nightmare. But we made it happen, and instead of using our homegrown solution, we now have a proper AD integrated solution. Uh, finally, data encryption and tokenization, uh, very important for uh, GDPR. So we tokenize encrypt data on Hadoop, but there is a problem. You have historical data, and you have new data arriving daily, whether that be batch or real time. This in turn means that you can't uh, utilize that data without having the data decrypted or encrypted entirely. So there are rules in place where we have to allow data to be unencrypted, which sort of defeats the purpose because you are only as strong as your weakest link, but it does solve for the data lake, and that's what we're looking for. Eventually, it'll be extended to source, where you encrypt that source, and then it'll just throw, uh, flow through the entire bank. Jeff? <coughs> yeah. Um, so with SSL, been a really fun one. There's no real automated way to do it. It's pretty much manual copying files around. Um, so we use a JKS file, which is a Java keystore file, and that will hold also a trust store. Um, if you don't know how um, 
SSL works, it pretty much works very similar to public key encryption or asymmetric encryption with these two keys. Um, so I think a pretty simple example of implementing SSL would be Uzi. Um, with Uzi, it's as simple as getting a JKS file, putting it in, uh, in a directory, and pointing to it. Um, but I think HBase would probably give us the best way to show how it works end to end. So we run HBase across a lot of data nodes, region servers across them, with two masters, thus giving us HA, or high availability. So we thought it would be as simple as just copying it on the masters and pointing to it, but it wasn't. What we actually had to do was copy out uh, trust stores across every, all the region servers, point to it, give it a common name, a common directory, and then that's the only way you could do it. You also had to update Hadoop's SSL client and server configs. Um, but yeah, it's a bit technical. Um, another cool thing we had to do was integrate HBase with Knox after it was SSL. And the nice thing about that, um, Knox's topology allows you to s specify both masters. So if you have failover, one crashes, it will automatically choose the trust store for the correct master node. <coughs> for integration conflicts, um, I think this is probably the most interesting one. It took us quite a while to figure it out. But we use an AD integration tool, it's third party. We'll just call it an AD client for short. And what this AD client allows us to do is basically integrate our physical and virtual servers to the domain, so join them. Um, when you Kerberize and Bari will do a pretty similar thing, but the problem is um, it creates an SPN or a service principal name. And there's one rule with Active Directory. You can't have multiple duplicated SPNs. So what they would do is the AD client would basically try to create an SPN for a server on AD, and then Embari would do the same thing. So the problem is the AD client would do a check. Does it exist? If it does, don't create it, while Embari will just create it regardless. So it took quite a bit of tinkering to figure out that we had duplicates, but once we did, it pretty much cleared up any issues we had. Um, and yeah, elevated accounts. So Bradley and myself, we're admins. We have a lot of power with root, but the problem is how do we stop us from doing the bad stuff? So we use something called elevated accounts, and we use a credential vault. So instead of us just logging into a server and elevating ourselves up to root, we would basically log into a credential vault, which is audited, and then it would give us an OTP, so adding second factor authentication, and thus allowing us to access that. The cool thing about it as well is it gives us another level of auth authorization. So at this level, we can basically um, instantiate groups in AD, and that would basically specify what we can do on the command line. So a group or an OU organizational unit would be able to dictate, am I allowed to run certain commands? And by doing this, you actually allow to define what root can and can't do. So it actually gives us a lot of fine grain control. But yeah, OK, so governance. I think this is becoming a buzzword. <laughs> a responsible approach to an autonomous experience. I think that's the philosophy we've chosen. <laughs> hope you like my stickman drawings. So what is governance? Um, the way we see it, it's to control and administer policy. So what does that mean? Regulations and standards. So there's a few things that you can govern, but we'll look at these. We have data and our users. So what can we govern surrounding our data? You have metadata, be it technical, operational, um, and data access, be it at rest or in motion. And with users, we have the same thing. We have data access, and we have platform access. So yeah, <laughs> this is the way we would like to see it, and what we're working towards, data and users in harmony. So this is a quick look at how we actually govern. So we use policies for data and resources, and for data, it pretty much works with Apache Ranger. It allows us fine-grained control over what users can and can't access, and on an even deeper scale, some kind of functionality authorization. For example, with NIFI, you can dictate what they can see or can't use on the flow. For resources, we use yarn queues, but we can go even deeper by using applications such as Spark with Spark Dynamic Resource Allocation, allowing almost the applications to self-govern within the defined queues. Um, for compliance, yeah. <laughs> as Brady mentioned, Poppy, GDPR, all about giving control back to the users over their data. So a good way to deal with this is obviously encryption tokenization. If we can encrypt, tokenize any sensitive data or anonymize the data, there shouldn't be any issues. And PCI DSS, um, if you're working with in, any kind of financial data or card data, you have to maintain and store and process that data in a secure environment. So that kind of brings up this next slide. Chinese wall, many of you may have heard of it. 
um, what it basically means is there should be no data leaving an organization. But it's kind of evolved to the stage where if, it, if data does leave the organization, it should be completely anonymized and therefore useless to the outside. But the cool thing about this is the concept of a Chinese garden, which is kind of having like multiple Chinese walls. And what this means is or different organizations sharing completely anonymized data. So it kind of adds value to the community. So governance challenges. So we use a bunch of internal enterprise policies for master data management. I mean, this is pretty much has to do with what we have on the lake, or, and is it accurate? So to do this, we have a homegrown metadata solution called OPMD. Um, it's pretty simple in the way it works. We use three primary components. One is called a load plan, and that pretty much dictates from ETL source what's going to happen with that data. Where is it going to go? Is it going to be stored in Hive, HDFS, and when it's going to happen? And we have another component called a load schedule, which is pretty much a point in time snapshot of a load plan. For example, today's load plan for a certain source. And the last component would be the status component, which is pretty self-explanatory. It allows you to see what happened. Did it run? Did it fail? Was it delayed? And what is the reason? Could be a trigger that didn't happen. And if it was something, can it be rerun? <coughs> so another big um, topic is global data ownership. Who owns the data? I mean, as admins, we shouldn't be able to dictate who has access to it. So that's where the concept of data stewards come in. They, will, they need to own the data, understand the data, and what it, what it means if other data is mixed with it, hence the term toxic combinations. An example of this would be a CVV database and a card number or PAN number database. If I have access to the one and I apply for access to the other, what's going to happen? Will I get access and why do I need the access? <coughs> Yeah, and we, then we come to auditing and alerting and reporting. So another cool thing is with uh, data stewards is, I mean, we define them on certain data sets, but as a data scientist, if they had to create a join between two existing data sets, creating a third new one, who's going to own that? I mean, these are challenges that I think we're all kind of looking into and facing. So with auditing, alerting, and reporting, I mean, again, who needs, what needs to be audited, who needs to be alerted, and what needs to be reported? I mean, these are challenges that we're currently facing. Yep. Okay, uh, so multi-tenancy. Um, interesting discussion. We had this slide at, or we had this conversation at the finance breakfast this morning, and uh, quite a few people were like, "What happens with multi-tenancy? We're running multiple clusters. Do we run one big one instead?" And the people running one big one, which is what we do, are currently having the conversation: Do we split it out into use cases, into business units? So quite apt. Um, so we have a coach here, all for one and one for all. Obviously, this is by the Three Musketeers. Uh, I'm sure there's some other origin, but yeah. So I thought it was apt, you know. We have to share and play nicely. Um, okay. So the concept of a data lake versus an analytics platform. This is a hot topic because people confuse the terms. People don't understand what a data lake means versus what an analytics platform means. So on one hand, you have the data lake. Um, a data lake is essentially where you store your data in a raw format, and then you have multiple systems and people access that data, um, almost as an offload, but it also has the analytics capability on top of it. Um, on the other hand, you have the analytics platform. This is a fast-moving, fast-growing application platform, which is meant for the data science community. These guys will be running the latest and greatest stuff, like TensorFlow or uh, graph capability or whatever else it might be. Um, and the problem is, is that combining these two is a challenge because executives see data lake, and they think, great, that's a common buzzword. But they don't see analytics platform. And what's happened with us is that we currently experience the issues where we move too slowly because we can't keep up um, as we're tied down with dependencies to other applications. Um, so is there a requirement to sort of split the two? These are decisions that we have to make and other people as well. So next you have queues and resources. Um, since we're running a single stack, what that means is that we have to manage our user base and the actual Hadoop platform. Um, so resource management is easy. You have a set limit that you can go to, and you can't go further unless you A, go to the cloud, or B, buy expensive hardware. The business units will pay for that, and they will be allocated their percentage. That's where queue management comes in. So the nice thing about running on a single application and a single platform is that you have elasticity. This means that you can sort of allocate resources that are idle. So you can save cost on your platform because you're running 
Um, cloud off also offers that with spin up and spin down, and I believe that'll be the future when it comes to this sort of stuff because the ability to have hardware spin up on the fly is extremely valuable. Uh, cost saving initiatives, all that. So this is how we manage a single stack application layer. So at the bottom, you have the enterprise lake. Uh, obviously, you have the managed queues and managed storage. This is managed by us. On top of that, you have your KVMs, which are essentially your physical servers that your business units will go out and buy. These are edge nodes and gateway nodes. So we have virtual machines allocated to each. Um, the nice thing about our platform is that we run a production set of data whilst having development and testing and production for the data science communities on top of it. So instead of creating a separate application platform where the data science communities will live, um, and duplicating the data, we just use one instance. Um, we also offer a proprietary data science workbench. So the intention for this is to have a specific set of software that runs that the data science communities can access, such as uh, web service IDEs or um, various analytical applications. I mean, H2O, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we manage our user base so that they are happy, essentially. <laughs> So we faced a lot of challenges. Um, back when we started this project, there was the question of should we use cloud computing? And at the time, and it still is, the answer is no. Um, there is too much risk with the unknown, and we're not sure about data regulation, data policies, with Poppy coming into play, it confuses things. But uh, there has been word that the massive data center owners such as Azure and AWS are moving to South Africa. So that will change things. How it changes things, we have yet to see. Next is queue performance. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard users complain about the cluster is too slow. It's not enough speed. Um, and you're thinking this thing is massive. How is that the case? But uh, users are never satisfied. So we try to create transparency. Um, a lot of the time, people will keep their workloads separate. We show the workloads in a transparent dashboard of all business units so they can see what they're, getting, what they're paying for and what's actually happening on the cluster. It tends to work out better because people are more satisfied that they actually understand what is happening to their jobs in the back end. Next are the data science workbenches. Um, so this is a complication because everybody wants to run different application versions. And we've tried to keep it a sort of standardized set. So we have release and N minus one release. And if you are behind that, you lose out. It's something that has to be enforced because if you don't, the data scientists will eventually have 40 different versions running across multiple stacks, and you do not want that. Next is le uh, legacy users. So we're a bank. We're 155 years old. We've got some uh, folk that have been there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years even. And these all users, all these users want to join the platform, and they want to see what's available. They want to say, hey, that, that application has all of the data in the bank. I want to use it. Um, so you have guys that are very inexperienced trying to utilize the applications on the platform. And it becomes a sort of training and upskilling session. So there's a lot of that that happens in the bank. And training is one of our sort of key downfalls, because there are very few people in the industry who actually understand what Hadoop is, what a data lake is, and how to utilize the tools such as Spark, et cetera. Uh, next is the API framework. So the API framework is essentially just an API framework. I mean, APIs have been around longer than most people. Um, and suddenly, containers and APIs are back in the fold for some reason. So it's become a priority to sort of set up APIs so that people can connect, systems can connect. And that has been looked at the architectural layer, and we're implementing it slowly. Finally, web services, um, how do users actually display their dashboards? Where do they do it? If they want to go outside the bank's network, what do we do? So we have to face those challenges as well. Um, a lot of the time, we build web services on the application or on the platform, as opposed to hosting them external. <coughs> cool. Yeah. So. Disruptive technologies, I mean, not many people like change nowadays, and we don't know what we don't know. Let me just grab this. So, I mean, these are just a few things that are going to be affecting us, whether we like it or not. Not all of them are bank-related, just in general, but something like quantum computing. I mean, what does that mean for security? Imagine being able to brute force your way through like the most incredible encryption algorithms in minutes or days. Adversarial machine learning pretty much machine learning that learns machine learning. So imagine a machine pa pattern that goes against what your machine anomaly detection models go against and learn kind of what the anti-patterns are, learn how to sneak their way through your security. Another one, emerging API threats. Like Bradley mentioned, 
pretty much an API. It's a window into an application, right? What if somebody hijacked that? They could literally change everything. I mean, there's a lot here that we can go into, but it's pretty much everything that is going to be different. And yeah. Um, thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hope you enjoy puns. Uh, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, we'll also hang around a bit as well to ask questions offline. Sure. sure. Uh, let me grab a mic. In your architecture diagram, did you mean to convey that dev and test have access to production data? Yes. So the intention is to say that if you have a development, if you have users who require dev, they will be able to access the production data. So the thing is, I mean, if you have access to the data, why shouldn't you have access to the data globally? It's a big thing at the bank. I mean, if you have access to it in the data warehouse, why not the data lake? Um, and that's becoming a common theme, is to give users access to what they already have access to. Um, so in data science, you want to try and build your model on as much data as possible. And the best place to do that is in a production environment where all the data exists. But my personal data is there. That is true, and there is risk associated, but your personal data is viewed by a lot more people than you'd like to know about, and you'd be surprised what actually happens in the back end. But all organizations are like this. Uh, it's one of the inevitabilities of having access to data and having data policies. Cool? Yeah, but the, even though it's called test and dev environment, it is in a, in a production in cluster, so not to say that it's unsecure or anything like that. Yeah, obviously this whole thing's been built around security. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Sure. Uh, okay, uh, you and then you. Um, you shown how you use the same cluster for analytics and data lake. Excellent. Um, now, what about an application? If my application needs to access to, I don't know, customer contracts, um, do I have to directly query the data lake as well, or do you have the ability to extract some data store for more operational workloads? So there is a requirement to uh, sort of access data in external applications. I mean, obviously the data lake isn't built for speed. So if you require it, you can export that data depending on where you want to go to. I mean, you could use a relational database, you could use a NoSQL database such as HBase. You could even use like a Lucene indexer to review your data in a searchable fashion. So there, are the, there is the ability to do it. Every system that connects to us has to be secure, though, to a standard. In doing so, it makes connectivity to those systems a lot easier. And we try to enable users the ability to do that themselves. But then up to the application to manage the synchronization and the updates of the data then? So there is additional complexity in actually getting data from the data lake to that platform. Um, if it's a real-time requirement, what we generally do is we break it off at source, and we enable it that way. But then that becomes its own separate sort of entity. Right. Uh, we try not to take the responsibility of too many platforms because of the complexity of the uh, ecosystem. Fair enough. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, very nice presentation. Really loved it, actually. A awesome. uh, few questions about the uh, application logs, which uh, basically the users are running uh, on the platform. Sure. How do you provide access uh, to the users to the application logs? So something like if you're running Spark jobs, so you have something like Spark history server. Yeah. So you can give access to people over there, but they can also see the application for the other users also. Yeah, so there's complexity in that, and it's a maturity process. Um, so one of the biggest things we want is limitation to what users can actually access from a logging point of view. So on the applications that they build, they have their own logs, and we separate that. But on, like you said, the Spark history server, it's difficult. And as far as I'm aware, the Spark uh, history server doesn't have the capability to stop users from viewing other users' jobs. But coming back to that, um, there is an important concept at the bank. We want um, the data scientists to share. So we don't care what different data scientists are running. So we try to anonymize the data so it's never in the logs. But we try to ensure that the data science community actually shares what they are doing with other people. Um, so we're trying to keep it as open and, trans open and transparent as possible. One more question. Uh, do you also have like uh, encryption zones in HDFS? And how do you uh, manage it that, uh, for example, if you have a multi-tenant environment, you don't want to share 
the data between the pro projects and uh, you yep. want to keep the sensitive data encrypted. So how do you actually manage it? So we have encryption zones like you mentioned. Um, we integrate with a third party application. We don't use Ranger's encryption capability. Um, external to that though, we use Ranger policies in order to manage access. So whilst we have encryption zones, that's managed by Ranger. The encryption itself is done offsite by a third party utility. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? Awesome. Uh, I think that's it then. Yeah. Oh, one more, one more. Sorry, one more. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> Just uh, last question about Yarn uh, queue management. Sure. Uh, how do you split your sources? Uh, uh, you said you have uh, different business units, but yep. do you split by business units, per, per project, uh, by teams? Or do you handle uh, to not waste resources? Uh, do you have a preemption? And if so, yep. how do you manage? Uh, so we do have a preemption. So we, okay, we've got dedicated queues for specific running applications. Those are dedicated, cannot be touched. Um, what we also have is we have percentage-based queues for business units that they pay for. It's basically what they, it's their cost. They pay us, we give them that percentage. What's going to happen with HTTP 3.0 though is that you can enable um, static allocations or absolute allocations. Ergo, you can actually apply memory and CPU, which is what we're looking forward to. As for preemption on the queues, essentially, uh, any application can go up to about 40 to 50% of the stack. We don't like to overcommit though. Um, and especially since there's roughly 10 or 12 business units on board, it makes things interesting. But we like to, we, we, we continuously monitor and integrate and change as is required. Um, this isn't something that you can just like sort of set and forget. It's something that has to be looked after because you will run into issues if you do not. Cool. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, and another thing about that, um, for example, a lot of our data scientists use Spark, and the problem is they would often basically specify the number of resources they want before they execute the job. So like a Spark submit, num executors kind of thing. And the problem with that is it kind of locks onto the resources, and it doesn't let go whether the user's actually using it or not. So the cool thing with uh, that Spark dynamic resource allocation that I mentioned is that you can basically allows it to scale. So as it needs the executors, it will take them, and as it let doesn't need them, it releases them. And you can also set a limit to how much it can take. So it just allows us better control. Awesome. I think that's it then. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.